So, well, hello and welcome. My name is Rexena Alavi, and I'm a faculty in the College of Liberal Studies. And while I have the mic, I'm going to take this opportunity and tell you that our mission in the College of Liberal Studies is to provide the highest quality interdisciplinary education to non-traditional students, promote lifetime learning, and encourage the work of active citizenship. So if you guys want information about College of Liberal <coughs> Studies, you're, I'm here, I'm one of our students here. So. Uh, come talk to me. Before I introduce our speakers this evening, our, I want to thank our sponsors. Um, it's College of Liberal Studies, College of Arts and Sciences, the Student Affairs, um, Center for Social Justice, College of International Studies, Department of Political Science, Department of Philosophy, School of Social Work, Sociology, History of Science, and actually a local business called Advanced Integrators. Does anybody know who that, what that uh, they do? They do <laughs> IT stuff. Thank you. I've been meaning to ask Lucy that the whole time. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what do these people do? I also want to thank the committee members. Um, Dr. Irvine was my, the co-faculty sponsor of the event with me. And the students are Lucy Mahaffey, Laura K. Seitzinger. Did I say right? OK, thank you. Please stand up so they can know who you guys are. Um, Nick Pinner, Jessica Wise and Megan Ross, so thank you. So these students really did almost all of the work. So they just they kind of called me and said, we're doing this. I'm like, okay. So that's really pretty much how it went. So it is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Murphy. Dr. Murphy is a faculty member at the English department at Loyola University in New Orleans. She received her PhD in African and African Studies program at Harvard University in 2008. I graduated in 2008, and she's so much more accomplished than I am. <laughs> Her research focuses on historical and modern slavery and post-colonial studies. She's the lead researcher at Loyola, Loyola's Modern Slavery Research Project. Her book, Survivors of Slavery, Modern Day Slave Narratives, explores human trafficking through the first person testimony of nearly 40 people who have been enslaved in the last 20 years. She's currently working on a book titled The New Slave Narrative, a literally critical analysis of the re-emergence of the slave narrative tradition in the late 20th century. She recently authored a report entitled Human Trafficking and Exploitative Labor Among Homeless Youth in New Orleans with Ray Taylor and Christian Bolden. Her first book, Metaphor and the Slave Trade in the West African uh, Literature that came out in 2012 won the African Literature Association First Book Prize. She actually also plays soccer and she, on Saturdays and, and Sundays and Thursdays and she missed her game to be here with us today. So they let's welcome <laughs> Dr. Murphy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you Roxana. And I, you know, so I really m appreciate that um, introduction because you named all of the units that helped to bring me here. And I'm really grateful to all of the people who brought me here um, and Roxana for inviting me. But I will rename Laura, Kate, Megan, Jessica, Nick, and um, the most important person who's like done everything. Lucy, <laughs> Lucy who's like, or probably not, the, you guys are all equally important, but still, Lucy, like, you guys have been amazing. It's been great to work with you, to have dinner with you, to get to know you, and to think about um, your lives and your work, and to learn more about the kinds of activism you're doing. So I'm inspired to be here. I'm really grateful um, to have this opportunity to talk to you. Um, did I miss any of the other than the niceties? Um, <laughs> You really I'm, like Oklahoma. I'm really enjoying myself here. And let me, uh, can I just take a second to actually say that? Yes. Um, this school, it just, from what I've seen in one day, really, really knocks my socks off. It's just really impressive. And I've been in the International Studies Department and, or program and in the Women's Gender Studies program mostly today. That's why I've been moving back and forth between those two departments. And it's just really impressed me. The students, the faculty, the buildings, the wood paneling. I really love <laughs> and it just makes me feel like I have to step up a little and like really do this thing. So, um, so it's been really nice. I've said if you know, if, you know, New Orleans, I, Norman looks nice, but I'm I'm gonna stay in New Orleans. But if if I didn't live in New Orleans, I'd be calling y'all up and being like, 
is there any place for me to hole up on that? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I'm really grateful. I feel like the welcome's been really warm. The talk today that I'm going to give is slightly different from what I said when somebody emailed me and I had to make up a title on the fly. Um, but, um, but it covers some of the similar kinds of materials and some similar ideas. Um, and it comes out of my research and out of my work. And you know, I, I know that probably there's a rule in like speech class that you're supposed to learn. I didn't take speech class, so I didn't learn those rules <laughs> that tell you that you shouldn't start by complaining. But I'm going to start this talk by complaining. I hate this movie. I hate it. I hate it so much. It is the bane of my existence. Everywhere I go, I run into people who have learned, as someone said earlier today, also I'm going to repeat some things that you've heard today because people have said such brilliant things since I've been here. So, um, so you might, it, we're just reinforcing. Good teachers reinforce, right? Um, so, so I'm not the first person to take issue with this movie, but you know, everywhere I go, people have learned from this, right? From, they've learned from taking it. If you if not, Taken's a movie about a single, important, self-important, white, former CIA dad whose poor, distressed, blonde, white daughter has to go to Paris for a study abroad where she is scooped up. I'm probably getting the details wrong. I've hardly watched this movie, actually, to be honest. But he gets scooped up by some nefarious, ne'er-do-well, Middle Eastern, ethnically ambiguous types who put her on an auction block and sell her to some other str strange people yeah. who then lock her up. Am I getting this right? You're lock right. her up, sell her for a try to, but if, I'm sure her reputation was not sullied. I'm sure she was untouched. But meanwhile, there are all these other, right? Um, meanwhile, there are all these other um, women who are locked up. Dad makes some really threatening phone calls, <laughs> and then um, and gets to be memed on that. But and then um, and then uh, and then he finds her because you know luckily she's got a dad in the CIA. Um, and uh, I wish we all had dads in the CIA. I guess maybe probably not. And <laughs> and then he arrives kicks in a door or something, saves a girl, runs out of there, leaves all these other girls locked up. It's like, yay, we saved the day, right? And I think that we get both our ideas of what it means, what trafficking is from that movie, and also the idea of what our role is in the anti-trafficking movement, right? We're going to be some kind of like really tough guy who's going to bust down doors and save white girls. And I find, I, I find this deeply problematic, right? And so I run into a lot of people who want to be engaged, and I want to help them be better engaged. So part of what I do with my scholarship is utilize it to kind of think critically about ways the, the anti-trafficking movement is working well and ways that it's failing. And, and talk openly about both those things. I would count myself as a member of the anti-trafficking <coughs> movement, anti-slavery movement, movements maybe. I think we probably should use a plural term. And so I say what I'm about to say today with love, right? And with hope and optimism. I'm not a crank who's just out there to, like a lot of academics think that they can make their name and their, their, their money on just taking things down. But any work that I'm doing to deconstruct this, I'm trying to use to build it back up. Right, so I hope you'll you'll see what I'm doing today in the generous. Um, I have no generosity for this, <laughs> but in the, in the generous spirit that I mean it to be. So I don't have to do all this with you, and that's great. I'm just going to skip these slides. Force, fraud, coercion, sex under the age of 18. This is the legal definition, right? Sex trade in the age of 18. This is I'm a Matul. She is sadly not here. She um, she was honored by President Obama in 2012 at the Clinton Global Initiative. It was her dream and the dream of the other women in the chapter, that last chapter of my book, where they interview each other and talk about what they want to have happen. One of the things they wanted was to be on Oprah, and the other was to, to meet the president. And, and Ima did eventually meet the president. When the president made this sort of big declaration of something that we knew but that a lot of the world doesn't know, that modern slavery still exists, right? And when we talk about modern slavery, a lot of people, you know, want to say, well, slavery ended. And I, I am extremely respectful of the fact that some people rightfully want to keep the word slavery sacred, that we don't want to use it loosely. And I don't, and I won't today. When I talk about slavery, I'm talking about people who are forced to work against their will without the ability to escape for the profit of someone else, right? I don't ever talk about my teacher as a slave driver. 
I don't ever say the IRS is enslaving me. I don't ever say anything like that. I use that word with extraordinary gravity because I know that it's important and because I know that it describes something that exists and I have met people who have been enslaved and I've had some shabby jobs. I've worked for some sketchy dudes. But every time I've decided that's the end of working that job, I, boom, I'm out, right? I'm like, I might not be able to afford to pay my rent next month, but I know I can walk away. The people that I'm talking about, and this is one of the great things about being a literary analyst in this movement or in this field, is that I can really pay careful attention to the way people talk about things. And it helps me better understand what is actually going on. And when, when people that I'm working with talk about quitting their jobs, they use the word escape. They escape their jobs. We don't escape our jobs, right? We get tired of them. We get mad. We say ugly things sometimes. We leave in a storm, but we don't have to escape our jobs. We're talking about people who are held in captivity today all over the world. And when we talk about this, uh, you know, Kevin Bales and other people who are really good with numbers suspect that conservatively we can say that about 36 million people are enslaved around the world today. ILO says 21, they use a slightly different definition. Kevin's team used to say 27. I'm gonna be straight with you. I don't care if it's 1 million, 100,000, right? Like I can't live in a world where there's slavery. I'm from the South. And while I am not guilty of having had slaves myself, I'm not guilty of the things my ancestors probably committed, I am responsible to ensure that it doesn't happen anymore. Right? That is where I stand. And so for me, knowing that, you know, they fight over these numbers, no, I don't really care. That's not what I'm in it for, right? They'll get that number, they use statisticians, figure things out. These estimates are close enough for me, right? That's not the fight I'm going to get into. But um, here's your definition. I really like talking to people who've already done this part of the work, where I don't have to, you know, like think, you know, constantly define things. So you're, you're here. But so as a literary scholar, my question was, if, if slavery still exists, are there slave narratives, right? Because I spent my um, graduate career studying the transatlantic slave trade and studying the narratives that people wrote about historical slavery around the world. And so I, I've read Frederick Douglass's narrative enough times to be able to quote it from memory, right? I've read Harriet Jacobs. I teach Harriet Jacobs. I, a lot of Quiano blows my mind. Venture Smith is a hero of mine. I think he's brilliant. I think about him often. I like think about Venture Smith, like when I'm brushing my teeth, like, wow, what would Venture Smith say about this? Like, so I think about slave narratives. And so when I learned about modern slavery in the midst of working on historical slavery, I wanted to know, are there slave narratives now? And what happened? And so, so what I found when I started digging was that starting in the early 1990s, about 1991, people started saying, claiming that their experiences of captivity in different forms, some of it in child marriage, some of it um, in, uh, you know, sort of domestic fosterage, domestic labor foster system in Haiti, some of it in Sudan um, uh, uh, because of like uh, war, um, time raids, child, they're basically child slaves, they're, they're domestic laborers essentially. These cases started coming up starting in 1991 with Zana Musen's Sold, but Escape from Slavery and Slave, Mende Nazar, the Sudan uh, books are 2006. Um, so th these are the first few books that came out that where people were explicitly evoking slave, the word slavery and the tradition of the slave narrative. Like, talking about Frederick Douglass, or mentioning Toussaint, or um, so, so the, the Jean-Robert Cadet talks about playing Toussaint L'Overture when he was a kid. It's really cool, Haitian revolutionary. Um, and you know, these guys you know, use the word slave, slavery, to promote their cause of you know, ending war in Sudan, or ending um, child slavery, or slavery in general in Sudan. Really evoking slavery, and I, I'm interested in a lot of things about this. Let me see if the next slide, I always move the slides around like the night before the talk and then I have to be like, does, is where I'm going what it's gonna say next? No, it's not. And so, <laughs> so, so, so these narratives um, emerged, but what's interesting is that, you know, there's Zana Moussen in 1991, there's um, Jean-Robert Robert Cadet in 96, then it's like 2006 before the Sudanese narratives come out. And hey, if you guys know of other narratives that do this work that really explicitly evoke the slave narrative, 
I want to know them. Like, I'm happy to completely revise everything I had to say. I'm always interested in changing this story. But after 2006, an explosion happens. And basically, in the, in the first, two, you know, first decade of the 20th century, people start really taking this subject on. Those were longer narratives. There are also tons of short narratives, including those that are collected in my book, um, which is probably the next slide. Boom. Shameless plug for my book. Um, but all these folks, some of whom you recognize, Evelyn might be on here. Oh, no, Grace is on this one. Um, who else did you talk about today? Who's up here? Oh, James isn't up here yet either. I'm is over here. Uh, all these folks are writing small narratives or writing visa testimony, like testimonies to apply for visa applications to the United States, doing all kinds of things to get their story out and to either help themselves or help others, and typically, usually, to help others. And, and thinking of their experiences in terms of the concept of slavery. And so, um, so part of what I did was start thinking about what this means, and I made this collection, there's my shameless plug, um, of, of, of those narratives, because I think we need to start thinking about these as slave narratives. And as a scholar, I have a lot of questions. As a literary scholar, I have a lot of questions about how the slave narrative functions today. What does it do? Who gets to publish? What are the constraints under which they publish? What are the politics of the publishing industry? Whose voice gets heard? Whose voice doesn't get heard? And then, like, what are the generic trends? Are they like the 19th century narratives? They are. The answer is they are. I'm not going to answer all these questions today. Um, and, and also, I wonder about what my role is. Um, because, you know, sometimes, I don't know how many of you are English majors, but sometimes as English majors, we feel like we don't really have the same skills that maybe a sociologist has, or maybe somebody who's in international studies or something like that. But, but so part of me wonders, like, what can a literary critical approach to these narratives help us do? What can it contribute to a bigger social movement? How can I be of use? Um, how can my way of thinking help us think about the work we're doing? So these are all questions. I'm not going to answer all these questions, but a couple of them are, are, like, are what animates what I'm about to, to explain to you today. So the way I'm going to approach this is by giving you a single example. I actually went to um, my students the other day, and uh, I had to give a talk at, at Simpson la two days ago. And Simpson College is a small college. They had, they had a lunchtime talk. And I, I realized that I was only, if it was just lunchtime, I was really only going to get 20 minutes. You know, there's going to be introduction. There's going to be Q&A. How do I, I went to my students. I was like, how am I going to, it's like make it only 20 minutes. And they said, one example, Murphy. Just one example. So this is the one I picked. So we're going we're gonna, to, but I'm going to bring in all kinds of other stuff. Don't worry. Um, but so this one example is going to be what helps us break down the, the argument I'm going to make. This is a book called Girl Soldier. It's written by two people. It's co-authored. One, Grace Acalo, who is here at the bottom. You, I, I can just tell you, you can pretty much predict that I'm going to complain at some point that Grace Acalo's name is second, because Grace Acalo is the girl soldier that is the, the you know, eponymous girl soldier. She, Grace Acalo was um, a, ca a Catholic schoolgirl in Uganda. When she was 13, I think, she was abducted by the LRA. You've heard of the LRA probably during that silly Coney 2012 Wahala. Um, and they, um, <laughs> she was, um, so she was abducted by Coney's army. And um, she was forced to be a child soldier. She was forced into combat. She was also forced to be a, a bride to one of the commanders. Um, and that's how she describes it. She was, she, I think she says something about, I was, I was, married off to a commander. Um, and, and she then tells the story, not just, and this is much like Frederick Douglass. She doesn't tell a whole lot about her real experience, like slaughtering people or killing people or shooting guns or even learning how to shoot a gun or anything like that. She talks about her escape. And her escape is, is, um, is uh, what would you call it? It's, it's constantly echoing biblical narratives too. It's very much about an escape across the desert to freedom, right? There's, there's a lot about resurrection. In fact, the first scene is about sort of a death and resurrection moment where she appears to be dead, but she's born um, again or sort of, yeah, or resurrected basically from the dead. Very much echoing um, a lot of Christian um, biblical narratives. And it's, it's a very interesting, very beautiful, like I'm a literary person, right? So I love all that you know, allegorical connection. I love, I love that she's playing with other texts. She's imagining her life on this larger scale. Um, beautiful, beautiful narrative. She 
co-authored it with a woman named Faith McDonald, who is, um, and I'm going to talk more about her, but Faith McDonald works for a think tank called the Institution for Religion Democracy that is pretty, it's like evangelical um, Christian conservative. And their concerns largely lie in, um, in undermining Muslim, uh, what, what do I want to call it? Like Muslim indoctrination, Muslim domination. That's, and it's really, that's like they say this sort of up front. That's their main goal. And they have a bunch of other goals, um, a bunch of other sort of traditionally conservative worldviews and, and goals. But a big part of their thing is about ending Muslim domination and, and ending Christian persecution. So they team up and write this narrative. Now, I'm going to talk about how that narrative works in a second, but one of the things that I, I want to focus on, Grace is part of the narrative. Grace's narrative um, is much like a lot of other narratives, and so it helps me to think about this question about how do they work, how, how do they function, how are they structured, what are their conventions. And, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. I have a list that's like a tiny, tiny font on the screen of all the conventions trying to break down. I have a spreadsheet of all the things that people do in, in the new slave narrative. But, but one of the things I want to talk about is the way they don't say some things. Because I think that just as important as what slave narrators do say is what they don't say. And I think that this is one of the things that literary analysis can contribute to our understanding is the silences that slavery keeps, basically. The kinds of things that people aren't comfortable talking about. Um, and this is James Kofi Annan, my buddy from Ghana. And he, he really well articulates it. If, if any of you are scholars of the slave narrative, this sentence is almost a direct quote, although he doesn't know it, of William Wells Brown, who says that slavery as it is can never be and will never be represented. Um, and so James echoes that sentiment, like it's really hard to represent truly any traumatic experience, but to represent slavery, you can never be captured in language. And he talks often about how it doesn't matter how hard he tries, he can never quite grasp the experience in writing, in words, for other people to understand. We talked about, some people talked about this earlier today, like we cannot represent the person's, someone else's experience. And this is a constant theme in um, narratives of people who've been enslaved in the last 20 years, and in fact, in narratives of people who've been enslaved for hundreds of years. And so, one of the things I study are the ways in which they sort of displace the narrative, like they move the camera away. If you imagine it like a cinematic thing, they move the camera away from themselves to focus on something else. In the very moment when they're about to hit the most traumatic experience, they'll suddenly skip a beat and they're talking about something else. And one of the ways they do that is by suddenly switching over to some other authority. And even in the, I t one of the things I talk about is paratextual authority. So like there will be the slave narratives in the 19th century often started with long letters from a minister or a poem by an abolitionist poet. Or if you've read the Frederick Douglass, you know that the narrative is pretty thin. There's just letters in the front and letters in the back and poems in there. Same thing happens in the, the 20th century. The sort of veracity test, you know, like, hey, if you don't believe me, look at this psychologist who wrote a profile of me and will tell you that I'm actually very much traumatized from this experience. Or a letter from a minister who says, this is actually what's happening. This is true. You can believe it. So those kinds of authority figures are in the text or around the text. And then within the text, they stop at the moment when they're about to reveal something really traumatic, maybe sexual assault, maybe a moment when they were engaged in violence themselves. They stop and they'll switch over to using statistics. So for instance, Rachel Lloyd, who um, who works, uh, she, own, she runs an organization called GEMS in New York. She wrote a book called Girls Like Us about her time as a forced sex worker. She like is in the middle of talking about the most violent, like this pimp that she worked for who was super violent. He's about to beat her up and she just stops and starts she's talking about statistics about pimps. Like it's just, it's really abrupt, right? She totally halts the narrative. James Kofianan is kind of remarkable in that every time he, he's not, He's kind of typical, but he does it so consistently that it's amazing. Every time he's talking about his own narrative, when he gets to the point where it's like really violent, he stops and he starts to talk about a kid he's helped who experienced the same exact thing. And so, like, in fact, this, he's so consistent at this that um, I was at a conference, the Nebraska conference actually, a few years ago. And, um, and he, I didn't know this, but he was slated to speak 
the night before the conference. They hadn't advertised it, nobody knew. Um, and so the scary thing was that he spoke on Thursday night and the talk was at 8 a.m. on Saturday or Friday morning. So right after, all I had was one night of sleep. And I was gonna talk about the way he does this thing where he projects his trauma onto another kid. And he was gonna stand up on Thursday night, just before my talk on Friday morning, and give his life story. And I thought, this, my whole paper could be gone. I mean, the whole thing could be gone. If he gets up there and reveals all of his secrets and like takes all his clothes off, you know, just boom, like I'm done. My paper's gone. But he got up there and instead, I mean, every single, and I was paying very careful attention because I was terrified, you know? Every single time he went to talk about violence or sexual abuse or anything that was really traumatizing, even illness, he would switch and talk about this young man Kofi, that I know, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, so it was, I mean, it was, I took notes. I was like, and yesterday you heard him say this. Um, it happens so consistently. And I argue that part of it has to do with trauma. P people who work on trauma theory talk about, you know, repression of traumatic memories and trying to assimilate traumatic experiences into the narrative one, of one's life. But I also think that for a lot of these narrators, it's a, it's a way of, of empowering themselves. Right? Of saying, I will not allow you to be voyeuristic on my life. Right? Like, will not, I, they shroud themselves in these strategies and say, you, I don't have to tell you all the nitty gritty of my life. Right? Their lives have been affected. Their, their bodies have been exposed. Their bodies have been used and exploited. And they resist further exploitation by leaving gaps in the stories and by deflecting, right? Displacing the narrative so that they're thinking about, they're allowing you to think about something else and not reveal their own selves, right? Or reveal their own pain or their scars. So this is a pretty consistent um, strategy that you see across slave narratives, across most of history, but especially in these narratives. But a lot of people who work with survivors want to suggest to them that they need to, let's see, that they need to, um, oh, so let me say this. That's not what I was, where I was going. Um, so Girl Soldier's not very different. She um, uses euphemism, for instance, when she talks about sexual assault. She's always using phrases that are not, that don't openly, certainly don't openly describe being raped, right? But also don't even really go very far. She was married off to a commander and um, the night she went to, she, so I don't remember how she said it first, but the first night she was with him was like a thorn in her side, boom, that is it. That's the end of the conversation, right? It's clear that she's being sexually assaulted, it's clear that she's being serially raped, but she doesn't go there, she doesn't describe that. She holds a lot back, she doesn't describe ever um, co committing any violence, right? And this happens often in, in, in child soldier narratives where they don't really describe it. It's varied, and we can talk about that. Emmanuel Jahl, for instance, does talk about it. Um, but he's got a very different kind of situation. He doesn't understand himself as enslaved. Um, but she very much holds back. Um, however, her narrative only consists of 65 of the 230 some odd pages of this book. Grace Acalo uh, Faith McDonald writes all the other pages, and her chapters are actually interspersed in between everyone. Her chapter, she has the first chapter, and then she has every other chapter, and then she also has the final word, right? So she tells Grace's story for her. She basically fills it, oh wait, I want to go to that slide. You can see where it says fills in the gaps, if, boom, right there. I want to go there, boom, um, but well, that's okay. <laughs> um, she, um, she takes it upon herself to tell the parts of the story that um, Grace has left out. She describes rape, rape in Uganda. She describes um, violence and the violence that kids are forced to perpetrate. She goes into the great details of what's going on. And as an academic, I know that part of my job is actually to fill in the context sometimes to, to help synthesize what's going on, right? But this is a narrative. It's supposed to be a first-person narrative. And Faith, instead of letting those silences speak, feels like it's her job to fill them, right? And it's interesting because of the way that gets framed, right? So look at this first line on the back of the, um, of the cover. More than 30,000 children have been conducted in Uganda. 
Now one of them has a voice. I haven't met anyone who doesn't have a voice. Even people who like literally don't have a voice communicate, right? People who are enslaved, and I thought that, uh, I think it was Whitney who was here today. Whitney did a really good job of, of, of saying that, like, you know, people have agency. They want to, or maybe it was Lucy, actually. Lucy was boom today, like just blowing my mind. Um, but, you know, people want to escape. They, they are empowered. They have agency. They, they're, and I, I have a whole other talk. In fact, part of the talk that I was planning on giving you about how we need to lower our cultural barriers that make it impossible for people to escape when they're ready to, right? That we make escape impossible for people by having certain cultural barriers and certain political and um, legal barriers for people from escaping. But, um, but they have a voice. They are communicating, right? And these organizations that will say things like a voice for the voiceless make me furious, right? Like, I don't speak for these folks. Grace, uh, like Faith McDonald tries to speak for Grace, even in the very book in which her first person narrative is being published, right? She, she says now one of them has a voice, and then she essentially usurps it. She takes it away. And it's interesting, they, you know, they have this part here, down here. I think my pointer part doesn't really work anymore. But um, a precious gift from two women, both uniquely qualified to speak for the suffering children of Uganda, to speak for them, right? So Grace, you might say, has some ability to represent, although she would just be one example. Faith McDonald definitely doesn't represent the women of uh, Uganda, the children of Uganda. And, and it's important to note this. When this book came out, Faith McDonald had never been to Uganda. And in fact, when she did go to Uganda, she has a, wrote a blog post about it, she brought a cyanide pill with her, or she at least contemplated bringing a cyanide pill with her because she was so afraid that she herself was so precious that she was going to be abducted by Islamists and she would want to be able to kill herself instead of being taken over to the dark side. So this is a person who is so radically unknowledgeable about Uganda and yet feels like she has the capacity to speak for the suffering children of Uganda, right? And so she fills in the history. Um, she fills, I think now we get to go to fills in the gaps. She fills in those gaps that actually, to me, speak about trauma, that tell us about what can and can't be said, that tell us about the experience and the, the way slavery gets represented. So she fills in those gaps. And I want us to look at how she fills in those gaps. This is her description of Uganda. A raw and savage grief fills the air. Remember, she hasn't been there in Uganda. She hasn't even breathed the air of Uganda. How does she know what it smells like? The sadness in that grief is overlaid with an evil so irrational and unfiltered that it seems like the stuff of folktales. Well, friends, it is the stuff of folktales. It is completely made up, right? This is, this is the worst kind of colonialist, you know, thinking. And it's being sold as... The narrative of what's going on in Uganda, representing the voices of the children of Uganda, saving Uganda, right? Rescuing Uganda. And this kind of idea gets very, it's infectious, you know? I've actually, at a school I used to teach at, walked up to a table that I think was um, staffed by young people who thought they were, you know, working for um, invisible children. And they had a big sign that said, save Uganda. And I went up and I was like, question one, what are you saving it from? Question two, and I pulled out this nice empty map of Africa that I happen to be carrying around. Point to Uganda, right? Right. We take up these causes. We we get told how to think about things. We our heartstrings are pulled by terrifying things like this. There are ogres in Uganda taking the children away, right? And let me just pause here and say, I have no good feelings for Joseph Kony. Zero. Dude is nefarious, right? But. Um, this kind of thinking totally generalizes about an entire country of people, Laura, uh, really a region, because she's not entirely sure where the borders, the borders for her are pretty vague. She tells a narrative, a historical narrative, in which Christianity did great things for Uganda during the colonial period, and it was Islam that was really enslaving people, right? Christians, they, she forgets about all of the history of the transatlantic slave trade that Christians participated in. She exonerates them entirely from that history and says that, and you know, and usefully is working on the East, so that makes it a little bit easier, though not completely true says basically they came to end slavery, Christians came to Africa to end slavery that, you know, Muslims were perpetrating. It's a book, for her, this book 
is, is an anti-Islamic diatribe. That's what she's using it for, right? It's her goal. And we, find, we figure that out because she goes on and on about how Joseph Coney is actually fueled and fed and um, funded, is the word I'm really looking for, the F word I'm looking for, um, by, by um, Omar al-Bashir, who's the leader of Sudan. Also, bad dude. I'm no way trying to suggest that these Islamic dictators or, or non-Islamic dictators like uh, like. Uh, he's got like that kind of weird Christian mysticism thing going on, or sim like pseudo-Christian mysticism thing going on. Um, I'm giving Spencer a run for his money over here. I'm like, I'm over here now. Over here. <laughs> um, but you know, so so that that. You know, she's constantly linking Coney to Omar al-Bashir. And then there, and through that, saying, this is a problem with Islam. We need to be careful about Islam. Islam is taking over, etc. Grace Akalo mentions Islam once on one page in, a book, in her book. It is not the point of her book. She's a Christian. She's very much like... Um, proselytizing is right. She's very much preaching about how Christianity saved her, how, how her belief in God is central to her freedom. But she's not, it's not an anti-Islamic um, text, except for in the way that, that um, Faith McDonald has infused it with these anti-Islamic sentiments. Um, and then she also does another thing, which I think is really sneaky and interesting. She tries to get you to identify with grace. She asks you to imagine that you or your children, she does this several different times, you or your children or your friends are experiencing the thing that grace experienced. And that's very affecting for the armchair reader who's sitting there and thinking about this experience. You get taken in, you think, oh my God, that would be terrible. It's really horrifying. What if it did happen to my daughter? I, you know, luckily I'm a CIA agent, so <laughs> I just totally take care of that. Um, but she puts you in that position of being grace because what she wants you to do is not just imagine for grace the pain that she suffered, but imagine for yourself. She wants you to basically imagine a sort of what I call a transitive property of suffering. That if grace is an oppressed Christian and you're a Christian, then you're probably oppressed too. And there's this whole movement about Christian persecution that plays on narratives, especially of African girl children, that appropriates their suffering and says that Christians worldwide are suffering. And therefore, either, either we should be afraid, right? It helps to, and this is why I think a lot of these narratives actually were published in the early, like right after 9-11. There's this 9-11, post 9-11 burst of these things, especially those that are written that are anti-Islamic. Um, or are funded by anti-Islamic organizations, and there are several, um, because they want to imagine, they want to increase your fear, your anxiety about like Islamists coming to take you away, right? Um, it's not about actually caring for the children of Uganda, that's right? It's about worrying about yourself and your daughter and your children, right? It's not about having a, a commitment to helping the children around the world, but it suddenly localizes it here and it, it raises a lot of money, it engages a lot of people, but it distracts us from the things that Grace Akalo is trying to say. We lose sight of the voice that Grace Akalo was putting, the claims that she was making. And her claims are her claims are definitely about, you know, how the church helped her, how praying to God was was central to her freedom, how that's central to her experience now. But her, her argument, her message is not that everyone in the world should be afraid. Her message is certainly not that um, Muslims are coming to get her, because no Muslims did come to get her, right? That's not her story. And so I like us to think about, I like, I like to think about this in terms of, and this is super unfair to William Lloyd Garrison, but <laughs> of, of the breakup between Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison. William Lloyd Garrison was one of the most prominent and truly, like, incredible uh, white abolitionist of the 19th century. He was buddies with Frederick Douglass. Um, and he and Frederick Douglass broke up because they disagreed about the tactics for making freedom a reality, for emancipation in the United States. And this is partially because, according to Douglass's side of the story, Garrison understood himself as the political one. And Douglass was supposed to just provide the story 
He was just a good storyteller. He was just the personal example of a bigger claim that Garrison was making. And when Douglas suddenly stopped believing in the claims that Garrison was making and had actually a different point of view, Garrison told him to shut up, that he was supposed to tell his story, that he was the story, and that Douglas was, and that Garrison was the politics. And he actually said to Garrison, he, uh, Garrison actually said to, well, a friend of Garrison's, said to Douglas, put on a little of the plantation manner so people will believe you more, right? So he was supposed to put on like an accent and act less educated so that people would believe that he was enslaved. Now in the 19th century, his black skin was testament enough. Like being from the South was testament enough, right? And, but, and still they thought he needed to put on an act and dumb down his, his ideas and just be the example. Where, and he was going to be the smart one, the one with the political stance. And I want to suggest that we need to be incredibly careful about co-opting the survivors' narratives today for our own political purposes, right? Faith McDonald can believe whatever she wants to believe. There are things that she believes, you might, you might agree or disagree with her stances, right? Um, but Faith McDonald's, I mean, uh, Grace Akalo's story is in, it resembles in no way the narrative that Faith McDonald tells. And so we need to be responsible as activists that our politics, our stories, do not override, overcome, overtake the um, narratives and politics and thoughts of the people who are, who are the survivors of this movement. And in fact, we need to um, think about, they, they call us to account to, this is Rachel Lloyd, who's saying, look, we want allies, right? They can't have a movement solely of survivors. I mean, I guess they could but they don't and they're fine with that. They have allies. We're happy to bring in allies who are not survivors. However, we need you to see us for our expertise, right? This is, this is Rachel Lloyd speaking. You need, to, you need to hear our voices. Don't dominate the conversation. CSEC is uh, child sexual exp or, uh, commercial sexual exploitation of children. Um, don't dominate this conversation. Faith McDonald, Donald's story literally dominates this text. It's, it's three times as long as Grace's story, right? Um, and so Rachel Lloyd says, you know, think about us. And, and Min Dang, who's a, a, a person who um, was uh, trafficked for sex by her own parents in California, says that, um, you know, think about how this process may contribute to their continued dehumanization. What are you asking of them, right? So, so Rachel Lloyd, for instance, often tells us that, you know, well, let me put it this way. When I stand up here, when I ask you what the question, you know, okay, what questions do you have? No one in this room is gonna raise his or her hand and say, tell me about the most traumatic sexual experience you've ever had. Nobody's gonna ask me how many sexual partners I've had. And Rachel Lloyd gets asked that all the time, right? She gets asked, how many clients did you have to serve? And you know, like, what, what's the worst thing that ever happened to you? Did they, they beat you, right? She gets asked about these horrific things. People don't respect her story. They don't respect the silences she's keeping. They don't respect the armor she's putting on to get up here and be an advocate. They don't respect the fact that there are gaps in her story, partially because she can't tell them, partially because she won't tell them. It's none of your damn business, right? And so she and men are, are sort of working to help journalists, activists, writers, re researchers from from feeling like we have to be those voyeurs, we call it sometimes humanitarian voyeurism, that in order to believe their stories, we don't need to have them expose themselves again. We don't need to exploit them again. We don't need to see the scene of horror. And I worked for some people who actually would say things to, to survivors like, if you're gonna tell your story, we need to know what it was really like. Like, what did it smell like? What, did it, what was hanging on the walls? Why in the world would you ask a survivor of, say, sexual assault or sexual, you know, sexual violence to describe the smell, the feel, the touch, the looks? The, it, like, it was like somebody who had taken a single, it was precisely a person who had taken a single creative writing class and thought that that's how you draw someone in, right? And, and, but, but we don't need those details to believe that this is true. We also don't need the numbers to be extraordinary. We don't need girls tied up with their hands, you know, pictures of girls in short shorts with their hands tied up. We don't need these things to believe that this is dramatic. The very simple facts are dramatic enough, right? There should be enough to convince most people. And so they're calling on us to stop dehumanizing them, stop depoliticizing them, stop imagining them to be just the example of our own politics, right? 
Um, and so people like you might wonder, what, <laughs> what, I'm really proud of this. <laughs> um, I've been planning, I've been trying to do this for, for like weeks, but I never have enough time, but today I was here long enough to be able to get this photo. Um, so, so people like you might ask yourself, like, well, what the hell am I supposed to do then, right? 36 million people, all these different forms of slavery, and, and how do I act as an ally? How can I possibly do it right? And I will tell you, look, I, my degree is in African and African American studies. Every single day, I can make a mistake in the way I think, the way I talk. I know where I was brought up. I was brought up in southern Louisiana. I know I was taught all kinds of things that are wrong. And I never know when one of those things might come up, and I'll be like, where the, where did I get that idea from, right? Like, you just never know. We're all brought up in context. And, and being in a, a world where there are great tensions and there are great controversies and there's great violence means that often we might make a mistake. We might come to a talk like this and not say, I would really like you to invite a survivor. We did it this time, we tried, we did what we could, right? But we might, we might sometimes lose ourselves and get up there and start you know, co-opting this for our own benefit. We might, some people like, you know, occasionally will make money off of things like this. Give mine away. Um, but it's treacherous terrain. It's scary. We make mistakes. We sometimes do things wrong. We sometimes have the wrong motivations. But we can, we can do it right. We can be circumspect about it. We can be really thoughtful about our engagement as activists. And sometimes we'll mess up, and that's OK. We've got to call it what it is, apologize, try to make allies, try to work as hard as I can. And the way we do that right, is by not being a voice for the voiceless, but by trying to be a megaphone. Many of us have the privilege that we get to have a platform where people sit and just listen to you talk for an hour. I don't know why I got up here. Right? I'm just some girl from a small town in southern Louisiana. I have no idea why you people invited me here. But I'm kind of excited about it. But, <laughs> but um, and uh, you know, every day I remember that. But I try very hard to use the platforms that I have, the privilege I have to be a megaphone for the claims that other people are making about what they need. Right? And that's, I think, what's really smart about what was Lucy, Lucy was saying earlier today about how we need to pay attention to what survivors ask for. We need to ask them what they need. And so I'm constantly doing these like, little focus groups, formal and informal, like, hey, legislators are asking me what, to, what kind of legislation we need. What we need? Tell me. I like, bring groups of survivors together to tell me what to say. I have them vet the things I talk about. I have them establish the platform. For the, for the work we do. And there are all kinds of political things that I'm riled up about that don't really get to be on the table, right? They're just some things I would like to like, go to the mat on. But in order to do this work, I have to sort of, um, what is it? Submit to the things that are most important to the people who are most affected. And on my spare time, I can fight about those other things, right? Um, and so, so I often, I, I suggest to you that the role we need to play is one that brings survivors to the center of this discourse. And as Whitney said, not as a spectacle, not pushing them out there to re-traumatize them, to ask them how many sexual partners they had or put them on local news, but to bring them into the center of the conversation as experts, to have them guide our work, to have them tell us what's most important, not up here from the ivory tower, not up here from DC, but on the ground with the people who are doing it. What do they need? How do I use the enormous resources I have to help their goals get met and be expanded? I think they are the people who are going to tell us where we need to go and what we need to do. I think that's it. I forgot about my, I forgot about my example. Will you take your questions or you want me to? Oh, questions. First of all, I will take questions until they throw me out. And then when they throw me out, I'll sit outside and answer your questions until I get tired. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'll answer your questions all night. You would take them yourself? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I have, thank you so much. This is really, really interesting. Um, I have thank a couple you. of questions. And one is um, how you think about the critique that's come from a number of African American scholars and activists who say using slavery is a problem. Yeah. Um, and it's a problem because it diverts 
us from dealing with the legacy and the heritage of slavery that's very much alive today in this country. Yeah. Um, and really, really object to the term. So right. I'm really curious about your response. I have lots of to answers to that. that. Yeah. Good, good, good. Well, go ahead and then I'll ask my. Give me the other ones in okay. that because I'm afraid we'll think of someone else and then. Okay, so second question is um, thinking about how sort of centering survivors in our response mm -hmm. can help sort of break the gridlock in the feminist community about sex workers versus prostitution. Man, so what are you doing after this? Can we go have just, I mean, because these, yeah, these it, are, like, these are the most important questions and I have really long answers and complicated feelings and thoughts and lots of questions myself because I'm still learning all the time I'm still thinking about these questions and these these two questions are probably the most fraught questions because it what you're pointing to and maybe I can answer them together I'm not sure but um, what you're pointing to are two of the most important divides I'll add a third um, and the third one has to do with what we're talking about here, like people who are involved in the anti-trafficking movement because they're anxious about in immigration and people who are anxious that we treat immigrants better. So those are two polar sides of things. And I, I don't like polars, so I'm going to try to break that down. But those are sort of a, one binary that's animating this movement. Another are the people who are like sex worker advocates, and then there are people who are people who don't believe that there's, that sex is work and that all sex there are some people, I'm just going to push it all the way at the edge. There are a couple of people who I actually have met who I think think all sex is exploitation, not even all s prostitution is exploitation. I think there's some people who wish we just didn't have sex at all. Um, and I, I've met those who, we have a sex problem in the United States, I heard someone say. I was like, I think we have a sex problem, right? Like, <laughs> I like how you were saying we need to say the word sex, right? Because we have to accept that there's sex. What do we do about sexual exploitation? If we don't talk about sex, we can't have sexual exploitation, right? Um, and, then, and then there's the people who um, are anxious about the terminology, like slavery belongs only to um, antebellum 19th century, you know, American slavery's experience, and those people who think we can use the word slavery to describe, you know, like my stubbed toe this morning or something, right? Um, those, that's less, but there's been people who are further in who have sort of a much more expansive vision of what we're gonna describe when we talk about slavery. I think the problem with all of these divides is that it misses the point, and I think it ends up being kind of a red herring. And I'm gonna answer the slavery question more specifically because I have a lot of respect and, and concern about that issue. Um, I think that for the most part that those divisions are drawing our attention away from the very real experience of exploitation that's happening for some people in all of those situations that we all need to agree needs to stop. So whether you think we should have more immigration in our country or less, whether you believe that sex work is a viable opportunity and option for women and empowering, or you think sex work should be stopped or that sex is, sex is exploitation, um, and whether you believe slavery is defined this way or that way, I think everybody in those situations believe that we should not be exploiting people who are selling sex, people who are immigrating to this country, or any people at all. And so one of the things I try to do in my, with my extraordinary privilege as a professor is to bring people to the table and say, let's talk about what we agree on. It is really hard. Activists do not like sitting at tables with people who have very different perspectives. And I will tell you, I will just straight, I, you probably suspect that I'm pretty liberal. I will tell you that people who are more conservative are more likely to come to the table. People who have, uh, I'm not kidding, like people who have my, like my political beliefs are more likely to be like feet stuck in the mud, I will not come and have a conversation. So I spend a lot of my time with people who have very different political, religious, social views than I do, but we agree that we are not going to stand by while people are enslaved in the world. And we set aside abortion. We set it aside because that is not what we're talking about, right? And so I was so, like, so pleased to hear you say that earlier today. Um, and s s because sometimes that's a thing that just ends up ending the conversation. So, but I do find, I do find that people who are, um, who are the religious right are more likely to come to the table and just say, let's have a talk. Let's figure out how to do it. Let's figure out strategies. Let's work. Let's work. Um, that said, I, um, I think that there are some really serious concerns, some legitimate concerns people have with, um, with the way this movement began. I think that many of the people who were instrumental in writing the TVPA in 2000 
did it out of totally different um, motivations than I have. They did want to end prostitution. They wanted to write laws that would stop people from selling sex. And they did want to end immigration. They wanted to create laws that would make it very much more difficult for people to immigrate. And those motivations have made it so that a lot of people who would be down for this cause won't go anywhere near it because they know that it's born out of that kind of um, moralizing, you know, moral leg legislation, moral moralizing le legislation. So that makes it very difficult for someone like me to come in. And it doesn't matter how many times I write that sex trafficking and sex work are not the same thing. It doesn't matter how many times I write, um, I have a whole article that condemns blackface abolition. Like, I have like articles that I think a lot of people should just throw me out of this movement for writing. Um, <laughs> not that you can do that. Luckily, there's no like membership drive. Um, but I write these, I write these critical things and, and a lot of people who are anxious about um, advocating for sex workers and advocating for a certain definition of slavery, they don't, I don't think they, they're reading what I'm saying. And they, I, I receive hate mail. I receive um, people who just don't understand what I'm, I, or just not listening to what I'm saying. Because it, th on the slavery point, I, I, I want to reiterate this, and it may not be enough for everyone. It may not be enough. I know people who were forced to work without pay, against their will, for the rabid profit of someone else, and were not able to leave. I'm, I've met these people. I've been all over the world. I've seen them here, and I've seen them elsewhere. And I have enormous respect for the people who were enslaved in our country in the 15th to the 19th century. This is the 17th to 19th century. And it is out of that respect that I call what I'm seeing slavery. It is out of the absolute certainty that we cannot allow people to be enslaved in this world that I continue to use that word. And there are people who I would, I think, naturally be allies with and who I share a lot of political um, views with who cannot hear that. Um, slavery existed before the United States existed. It's going to last long after our planet is destroyed. I, um, it's, it's, it's a really hard deal, thing to deal with, and I understand that people are sensitive about that word. That is kind of why it's important that we use it and we don't look away. We're, I'm talking about slavery. And so I struggle with it. There are people who I like, who don't like me. Um, but I'm willing to keep talking with them and thinking about it. And every single day I'm circumspect about it. I make sure I'm, I really mean what I'm saying. That's the best I can do. I don't know if that helps. Um, you're at, I, have you been at the table talk with Eric Thoner with his new book on, on mm -hmm. Underground Railroad? Because mm -hmm. I'm struck by the similarities and the differences mm -hmm. uh, between what you're saying and, you know, where, I don't know, he, you know, personal and political, and you're stressing the trauma more and he's stressing the political more and he's mm -hmm. stress, stressing the, the numbers more. but. I wasn't going to say this, but think about that. It which seems to me that you bringing up trauma would help people to think again about the trauma of slavery in... Yeah, people think about... So people do really great research on the trauma of slavery. I, 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 um, I highly recommend the work of Sadia Hartman, for instance, out of Berkeley. She wrote a book called Scenes of Subjection, which I think is brilliant. Um, and about the spectacularization, spectacularization, uh, I don't know how to say that word, um, but the, the spectacle of slavery and women's bodies, enslaved people's bodies, um, that I think is echoed today and that, you know, sort of a conversation back and forth is really fruitful and useful. I hope that some of what I'm discovering, and some of what I'm discovering about the way slave narratives work today will illuminate things when we go back and look a 19th century slave nervous. I know it's working that way for me, that I'm suddenly thinking, oh wait, I've never read anybody talking about what it's like to pick tobacco. I've never read anybody talking about, um, you know, like the process of making cotton. Although that's what they did every day, all day. Like th there's like one scene in Solomon Northrop where they're getting their cotton measured. Every now and then there'll be a scene in the field, but people don't talk about the work. They don't talk about the work just the same way people don't talk about the work here. They talk about, and, and Paul Lovejoy has a really great article about this, they talk about freedom, right? They talk about 
that Paul Lovejoy says it's, that, that slave narratives really, most of them should be called freedom narratives because the vast majority of the narrative is actually focused on freedom. And one of the things I'm thinking about then is like, what kind of freedom? And actually, that video you showed about Evelyn Schumbau was awesome. I'm going to totally use, I haven't seen that video. I know her, but I haven't seen that video. And I don't have any transcripts of anything she said, but that video helped us think about what she considers freedom. And I, I think that, you know, that we think a little bit about, like, uh, Harriet Jacobs, for instance, she talks about like not still not feeling free when she was boss in Boston because she always felt like she was being followed, chased, she could always be caught. And Evelyn Chimba was talking about the same kind of thing. She said, I was enslaved from the time I was 19 until I was 17. No, actually it was like, uh, but I often say it was till I was 21 because for the four years from the time she was 17 to 21, she was caught up in, a, in an immigration system that she was constantly being interrogated in. She didn't feel free even then, even once the government had gotten her out or even once she was, she was being um, processed to, be, uh, to have status here in the United States. She felt like that enslaved her kind of, she didn't use that word. And so I'm thinking about what does it mean Freedom is not the opposite of slavery, just like sex worker advocacy is not the opposite of sex work is never exploitation, or is always exploitation. Um, like these binaries are trapping us, I think, and making it so that we can't actually think about the complexity of what's going on. And I think that her definition of, of saying that she was not free yet, she was not yet free, and that even now she's worried that her son is gonna be um, kidnapped by her, killed by her um, trafficker's family, that was incredibly, um, interesting to me about thinking about what it means that freedom is not just the lack of slavery, right? So I'm trying to use that then to think back to 19th century narratives too. I'm hoping this, I'm, I'm hoping this completely reshapes slave narrative studies, but um, that's a little ambitious. But at least I'm hoping that people who do slave narrative studies are going to read this and, and, and have it sort of jar some ideas about. I'm thinking maybe he needs an extra chapter now after... You know, what you Tell mean. Eric to call me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like that guy. Um, yeah. Not having read Girl Soldier, is uh, Gloria's narrative about the victim, in your opinion, demeaning, one, and two, how would you have done it written differently? And three, is there a niche for Gloria's type narrative? There's some maybe where it's born for Christian or her audience is sensationalist that uh, may get people that might not otherwise read a mm -hmm. pure narrative involved. Yeah. In, uh, whether it's, comp like you say, contributing comp money or doing something? So, so that's a triple question. Actually, I think it's kind of different. I think people come to it thinking they're, they, they want to read a memoir. There was, in the 1990s and early 2000s, there was a memoir boom. Everybody got excited about reading memoir. They'd been watching Sally Jesse. They'd been watching Oprah. They wanted to hear stories of, like, I, I kissed my dad and I liked it, right? Like, there was, like, all kinds of, <laughs> it's true. You remember that book, The Kiss? But so, like, um, it was, it was, a, it, yeah, anyway, it was, it was a disturbing time. You might remember. <laughs> um, and so people, people want to read first person narratives. They're really excited about it. And so I feel like what, what Faith did was take advantage of the fact that people wanted to read Grace's narrative. I mean, you know, of course, you know, Grace only gets published because Faith said so, right? Grace wouldn't have otherwise had an, a platform to get her book out. So fair enough. But like people came to it wanting to read Grace's narrative. Um, but what could Faith have done differently, right? Um, what? How could you have done it differently? How well, could I, my question is, how would you have done it differently? How would I have done it? Well, so, so I've done it differently. Um, and you can judge. I've put it out there. You can write a scathing review of it. If Faith McDonald wants to you know, write something nasty about me, she can. She won't be the first. Um, but the, um, <laughs> but um, the, so, so when I first, um, I'm going to tell you a story to get there. Um, when I first discovered this, when I was doing my dissertation working on um, historical slavery, I discovered slave, slavery still existed and I, I, like I had never been like a tree hugger or a save, I never saved any whales or anything. I wasn't an activist. This thing called me. It, I thought, you know, I am a Southern Louisiana girl. I cannot abide by this. This is the thing I can't live with. And I just got on the phone and called the first anti-slavery organization I could find in the town I was in. I was in Boston at the time. I said, I'm coming over. Tell me what to do. Like, I just showed up. I was like, this is, this is, I gotta do something. They happened to be working on um, a collection of slave narratives. I was like, this is meant to be. This is what I study. This is what I do. And they were the ones who were trying to get like narrators to um, tell like what's the, what the room smelled like and like wh how all these gruesome details. You know, you really didn't explain how you slaughtered that kid. What do you mean? Um, 
And I realized that what was happening was that people were in many, many different ways embellishing the narratives with what they expected needed to be there or what they expected you as a reader needed to be engaged. I have more faith in you. I actually believe that you are smart enough to read a narrative that has narrative gaps in it and understand that a person has decided not to tell you that they killed a person because it's not easy to talk about that, right? I, I trust that I can give you a smart and in-depth description of what's going on, not a shallow colonialist racist <laughs> description of what's going on, not a simplistic, binaristic version of what's going on, and you will understand it. And I know that because I teach 18 to 22 year olds all day, and I taught eighth grade to 12th grade, and I know that people are ready for what you put in front of them. So I think let's give the world this issue with all its complexity, and let's give it this issue with its gaps and holes. And so when I did my collection, it was in part to make up for the fact that every time you read a narrative, it's been restructured, it's been it's had it's been embellished it's been edited a creative writer has added often in the longer narratives there's a moment where they're contemplating the sunset at the beginning and it just happens so many times i'm like come on friends like really is that like what school are you learning about this sunset trope that happens in other places right the sunset they had an idyllic youth it was they were poor but they were happy um and said so, like every narrative starts this way it's on the spreadsheet um but so I just said, okay, let's, let's put these narratives out there unembellished. I have introductions that give you sort of facts and help you think about trends in the narratives, but the narratives themselves are theirs. And I, I, I think because I studied the historical slave narratives, I know that I want to see what they actually wrote. You know, William Lloyd Garrison's letter might be at the front of it, but the narrative itself, I want to see it in its, for itself, right? I want to know where it came from. Why was it written? What, when was it written? What organization spurred them on? So that, that like, I try to give, like, a little bit of a, um, like, a little context box at the top. So, like, what kind of document? Is it a visa narrative? Is it an oral narrative that they told? Was it an interview? I bring back the questions as much as I can. Like, Free the Slaves has all these narratives. And they've taken the questions out and just squished them. And you can see all of what the person said. And you don't see the apparatus. The apparatus is important. Why are they saying the things that they say? It turns out at the end of every interview, Peggy Callahan, bless her heart, asks people, what do you dream and wish and hope for? At the end of every, uh, everything. So every one of their interviews ends with some like, yay, happy, proud moment. And I'm like, why is that? And then I listen to all the interviews and it's because at the end of every interview, she says, what do you wish and dream and pray for? And so, and that's fine. I just want to know it's there. I want to know how they told that story and why they told that story and how it functions and, um, and what they're thinking when they're saying it. So like, I think that we are mature and intellectual enough to, to read those things and consume them on our own. And I might give you some, some way to think about it, but I want you to be able to come away with it thinking it whatever you want. I'm not going to bookend it with my politics as best I can, but I'm still me. So there's still some stuff in there where I'm like, oh yeah, and don't think like this. <laughs> I'll admit it. I fail a little bit, but yes, sir. I'm curious because I'm just not knowledgeable in this area. How much role does the publisher have, though, in the final output of that? Is this a huge folly on the part of writers, or there is a select number of publishers even willing to take on these projects that are forcing the interjection of all these extraneous things that are drawing away from the narrative? It's all those things. It's all those things. So part of it is the people who are um, uh, who are you know, meeting the, the people. Look, James Kofi Annan has asked me a million times to write his narrative for him. And I just am like, I can't. I know you're going to have somebody else do it, but I can't, right? I just am the wrong person to do that. I'm, I'm going to study it. I'm going to write about it. But I, I can't write your narrative for you. Um, so some of it has to do with the, the skills and the training and the interests and the beliefs of the per people who co-author. Some of it has to do with what's allowed to get out. So for instance, if you, um, if you sided with the LRA, if you were like, I'm a child soldier for the LRA, your book is not coming out. Like as much as we all would want to read that, that would be fascinating. There are very few people who want to be the publishers of a pro LRA book, right? And so like, it depends on what your politics are, where you stand, what you're telling. And so some of it has to do with the conventions. And, and I will say this. A lot of it has to do with our expectations. Because whether we know it or not, we have certain, ex like, we're, like I'm saying, like we have these voyeuristic expectations. We also have expectations for how the narrative is going to be structured. 
uh, historical slave narratives always started, I was born, and tells a story, tell a story about, not always, but typically, I was born on a tiny Kentucky farm, I didn't know my mother, or I was separated from my mother when I was five, until I was five, I, I didn't know what slavery was at all, I lived a blissful, you know, childhood until that day when I was separated, etc. They start like that. Today, most of them start with a flashback in the action, because I think that publishers think that, and editors, think that we won't suffer through the boring beginnings, that we need some action to get into it, so it's always a frame narrative. Um, and we expect these certain things. And as a result, I think some really complicated things are happening. So about a year ago, year and a half ago, um, a woman named Somali Mom, who um, is a Cambodian uh, sex trafficking advocate, um, was, was discovered, although there have been many, 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 many um, articles pointing to the fact that some parts of her story were untrue. I want to argue, and I'm arguing, I'm writing, about how, um, how part of, part, like, she can't avoid having her story be untrue. Because her story has to conform to the narrative structure that we've decided a slave narrative has to take. And if it didn't conform to that structure, we wouldn't actually believe her. And so she loses both ways. She, she either has to tell the story we want to hear and therefore has to lie, or she, and so there's, there gets found out to be like we believe she's a liar, or she tells the story we can't hear and so we don't know it's true ever either, right? She loses both ways. And so, um, so I think that we put so many, we as readers unconsciously and the publishing industry um, expecting what we expect, like projecting what we're going to expect, put so many constraints on people who are, who are trying to tell their stories that it's, it's almost impossible to tell a true story. So it's, it's, it's a complicated game, and I, I don't know how to fix that. I, like, that's where my, like, I'm a critic and um, I don't know what to do kind of comes in, but these things that I'm writing and the things that I'm saying are meant to sort of help us, like, kind of hit the brakes on our, humani our idea of what, like, humanitarian discourse should look like. And uh, there are a lot of other people who are working on this, obviously, in other fields, but this is another example of how we can kind of be circumspect about how our, um, yeah, our humanitarian discourse limits what gets to be true and what gets to be heard. Does that answer your question? Okay. You guys are tired. I cannot tell you how grateful I am that you came out on a Friday night. That was the other thing I wanted to say before this thing started. I mean, it's Friday night. I'm going to be straight. I would have been somewhere else. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm really, I really respect the energy and um, commitment you all have to this issue and to, to being out here. Um, I, here's what I'm gonna, here's the deal I'm gonna cut you. I'm gonna stay right here. And I will sit here and answer questions. You all should, from this point on, feel totally welcome to trickle out, grab your bags, you know, get a coffee outside or something, talk, and I will stay until nobody else is sitting here. But I'll take questions until until you're tired. Well, why don't we thank you for yeah. coming? Yeah. <laughs>